Hi guys. So we're picking up where we left off last time. Um, Early was just about to tell more about the next part of the story of Pi because him and Jack are lost in the forest and Early's like, this is part of Pi's story. And so Jack's like, well, what's next? So let's find out. So this part is Early telling the Pi story. The Ancient One. Pi wandered in the maze for hours, maybe days. He turned left, only to find himself blocked on three sides in a dead end. Then he'd backtrack, and this time take a right, only to find his way blocked again a little farther on. His mind began playing tricks on him as shadows grew longer and the path of the maze seemed to toy with him, leading him the wrong way time and time again. As he became more lost, wandering in the tangled woods, it seemed that the maze was more in control of his journey than he was. It led him deeper and deeper into its twists and turns until eventually Pi was paralyzed by his inability to set a course and move according to it. He lay down, overcome by exhaustion, and closed his eyes. Maybe if he could sleep, he thought, he might wake with a clearer head and a better sense of the workings of the maze. <laughs> Just as he felt his body give into the watery, floaty sensation of sleep, he was awakened by a sound, a bell. It rang with a clarity that drew him to it. Then he saw her. She must have been the oldest person in the world, with white flowing hair cascading over her thin shoulders, pale and wrinkled skin, and eyes that held the memories of centuries. Something in Pi held him back, but the ancient woman saw him and beckoned him forward. She placed a mantle around his shoulders and took his hand in hers. Come, she said, you belong here. You need to be here. It was the word need that struck him, and he knew that hers was greater than his, but he followed her. She took him to her home and fed him savory meats and delicious fruits. She gave him warm clothes made of soft and colorful fabrics. She spoke to him words of comfort and solace. Once he suggested that it was time for him to leave, but she only explained to him that this was his home. She tried helping him recall stories and events that were first unfamiliar to him. But the more she described them in great and wonderful detail, the more they became his own stories, his own experiences. Swimming in the stream as a boy, fashioning toy animals from twigs, picking flowers for her in the meadow. Her memories washed over him, making him think that they were his memories. She called him by another name, Phileas. It must have been a nickname he'd forgotten he'd had. Soon he forgot about a world outside this ancient one encased in a maze. As time passed, he no longer thought of leaving. He grew comfortable in the home of the ancient woman until one night. It was late. He was just finishing drawing water from the well before bedtime when a dark, shadow, shadowy form crossed his line of vision. He couldn't quite make out what it was at first, so he followed it into the trees. A few steps, then a few steps more. The moon shone bright in the sky and revealed a clearing where he saw the dark from before, dark form before him. A bear. Something shook loose within him. Maybe it was the way that great black bear held him in his gaze. Maybe it was the way the breeze ruffled his hair as he gazed back. He remembered something. Something apart from the memories of the ancient one. A memory that was his own. It was of a different woman who spoke words of comfort and solace. A woman who ruffled his hair while she told him stories. A woman who told him to keep his eyes on the great bear. Because the great bear is a mother bear. And a mother's love is fierce. There was a great rending within Pi as he realized he had been lulled. Just as he had been upon entering the maze and drawn into a life that did not belong to him. Returning to the house, he took one last look at the ancient one. As she slept in a chair by the fire. He placed an extra shawl around her shoulders, tucked it under her chin, and kissed her on the cheek. That night, under the cover of the darkness, he turned his attention from the Ancient One, who had mesmerized him with her comforts and stories, back to the Great Bear, whom he had lost sight of for so long. The maze did its best to divert and distract, but Pi no longer looked to the path to lead the way. He kept his sight on the Great Bear to guide his steps, and just as the sky was growing light, he made his way clear out of the maze, its brambles and bushes, its twists and turns, and found himself once again facing the ocean. It beckoned him, but he was so alone, and he had lost so much, so he turned away from the ocean and set out on foot once more, in which direction he couldn't say and didn't care. 
Chapter 24 Early had a way of Early had a way with his story of Pi. He was so convinced that we were following in Pi's footsteps that I found myself cocking my ear in anticipation of hearing a faint chime of ringing in the distance, just like the bell sound Pi had heard when he was lost in the maze. But I heard nothing more than the sprinkling of rain, which was beginning to fall on the trees and leaves around us. My face was hot. How could I have fallen for this craziness and let Early sucker me in with his story? So Pi heard a bell that led him out of the maze? Well, lucky for him, I said, pulling the rain poncho from my pack and putting it on over my already damp clothes. I don't hear anything but the sound of us getting wet. We'd better keep moving. Early didn't respond. He seemed lost in his musings about Pi as he put on his own rain poncho. That was okay. I didn't want to talk anyway. And pretty soon we were trudging along in a steady rain that soaked our shoes and chilled us to our bones. I wished I had the wide-brimmed Stetson that I could still see hanging on the hat stand in our mud room back home. I hadn't brought it to Maine because who needs a cowboy hat in Maine? But just then, it would have provided some protection for my rain-spattered and scowling face. I narrowed my eyes so that they were only open a slit and tried to let the sounds of the wet forest guide me. It's amazing what you can hear when you're not distracted by seeing. A few squirrels and birds chattered and squawked, first to my left, then to my right, as if playing some sort of forest game of hide-and-seek. But as we continued on and the day grew darker with more clouds and trees, the noises grew darker as well. The wet leaves gave a sucking sound beneath my feet, as if trying to pull me into the ground. The rain lost its pitter-patter as it grew heavier, seeming more like a heavy sigh now. The whole forest exhaled an ancient breath that must, it must have held since its trees were saplings. I felt as if I were being drawn deeper and deeper into the mystery of the woods. I knew that inside each tree, etched into its core, were circles, each ringing, telling the story of a year in the life of that tree and this forest. What kind of scars and jagged lines would someone find in the life of a tree, I wondered. Did people have telltale lines like that? Would, what would mine look like? I didn't need to see them. I knew they had been severed last summer. A gash had been cut into me so deep that I felt that I was at the tipping point when the lumberjack is just about to yell, Timber! But somehow I remained poised in precarious balance, not sure which way I might fall. As I let my thoughts ramble, the sound of the rain changed, becoming tinnier. Oh my gosh, my dog like the pinging of water off a metal roof. Maybe there was a barn or shed nearby. I veered toward the sound, not because I was trying to find its source, but because it was the only way the narrow path would let us go. The pinging got louder and more rhythmic. It reminded me of my mother's laughter, light and musical. The forest must be playing tricks on me, I thought. I could almost hear her calling my name. Jackie, Jackie, time for supper. My steps quickened, even though I knew it wasn't real. It was probably just the wind rushing through the trees. Do you hear that? Early said, drawing me out of my reverie. No, I said, not wanting to let on that my imagination had run away like a bee-stung horse. <sniffs> Besides, what could I say? Hear what? That woman calling out from the middle of nowhere? You'd think I was crazy. Hear what? I said. That woman calling out, he answered, plain as day. Then we heard it again, closer, the rhythmic sound. Ting, 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 ting. Without warning, the trees opened onto a tiny clearing where there was a rusted out Model T providing a rain break for a raccoon lounging underneath, a worn out old log cabin, and an even older looking woman with a long gray braid that hung past her waist. The braid swung back and forth as she worked a metal rod around the inside of a triangle, making rhythmic clanging sound. Martin, she called, time for supper. Early and I watched her long braid swing to and fro. I wondered if she had one twist in her braid for every year of her life, just as a tree had one line in its core for every year of its life. If she did, she'd be over a hundred. And she looked it. She's old, I whispered to Early. He shook his head. She's ancient. I hung back under the cover of the trees, still clearing my head of my mom's voice calling me, realizing it was just this old woman calling out someone named Martin. But Early had his own plans, as usual. Go on. He gave me a shove, pushing me out into the clearing. She said it's supper time. 
The woman stopped wringing her dinner triangle, waving the clanging rod in midair. She'd spotted me. Well, there you are, she said. Come in, come in out of that rain. You'll catch your death. So, again, I'm seeing a lot more connections between Pi's story and Jack and Early's, and we're going to have to find out what's going to happen with the old woman next time. See you guys later.